cancellation of Uber on the Gray Line tour at first because this one was sold out. There was a cancellation of that out as well. We had to pay that extra money. What for you travel one day? One extra day. This year, I think they're projecting about $1,500 per person. And all you have to do is live in the state of Alaska. And pretty nice deal. Uh, all comes off revenue from the pipeline. About $22 billion in reserve in the state of Alaska. I won't talk too much about the pipeline right now because we'll be stopping here on our way back. But the pipeline, it's 800 miles long. Runs all the way from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. They decided that uh, the ground would be too unstable to put it underneath the ground, so they actually built it up on those uh, support members that you see there. We take even that sometimes every other day and put them in the back. We, you know, they put really much time to do too much effort up there. Of course, there's only a huge, huge amount of you that you'll never get. Yeah, I know. Oh, you did bring a lightweight one. Down here, I'm going to show you one of our very famous discovery shafts that were dug by the Street Brothers right around the turn of the century. This would be a winter operation. You want to get a picture of this close on the outside. Oh, you were. Now, weather permitting, this is what it looks like. This is stock pile of material, fire tent to keep warm, or on board for the wheelbarrow. We have Bobby on this side. Oh, on the other. There's a bucket on that spindle. It's only 14 feet deep on the way to the So, see, they let the bucket down, they've got steps they can down. Fill the bucket up and back on the steps. Working together, stock pile them to get logs, moss and grass, and cover up those shafts to keep them cool. That'll keep the tunnels cool. And there's no shoring or timber at all, hardly any of those because of the permafrost. That's why they take them very comfortable. As we head on in here, keep all those cameras in. And all the segments that you'll see here, once your eyes adjust here, we've got some lighting on some of the segments. So you can take a look at some of our very, very old strata. Now remember, we just cut a hole through the bottom part of the mountain here. Then we cover them. Reinforce it with concrete and steel for your safety. And by the way, while we were here, I don't know if we kept them, I'm going to show them to you here. They'll be on your right. There's a couple there. We've got some of the segments, too. Now, be ready. We'll be coming to a full stop. You'll see a young miner here on the right. You'll see a carbide latch on the top of the fire now. His name is Tim, and when he says good morning to you, do me a favor, I want to give a real strong hello, Tim, in return. He won't be able to hear me talk until uh, 
Let me shut the engines down. So you ready for the brakes? The ones we shut the engines down. I'll take just a few seconds to introduce them to you. They'll say good morning to you, then we'll give them a big blast here. Okay, now we're going to shut the engines down. You folks on the outside on the left, go ahead and stand up and give me just a minute here. Tim, I'd like to say good morning to you. I have a great group of folks here visiting the Eldorado. By the way, the A train has arrived. Would you mind taking a little bit of your extra time here this morning and talk about some tunnel drift mining for them? Sure, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Sounds like a wave from the front of the back. <laughs> Well, as Earl said, I'm here to share with you a little bit about how they did tunnel and drift mining back in the old days. As Earl may have mentioned to you, those miners spent their winters digging. They would begin by digging shafts straight down until they hit bedrock. Now, behind me here against the wall, you can see what that bedrock looks like. The bedrock is settled down below here. And it forms a distinctive line. It sort of goes up this way and goes down over there. Can everyone see that line? Not here anyway. And for those of you in the back, the same formations are more easily visible for you on the far face back there. And we have that lit up for you, as well as this face here. I'll point this one out, too. The bedrock begins down below here and forms a line that goes up this way. Now, this is all bedrock that's been broken up and moved around and heaved and buckled. You might notice with this particular section how the bedrock's slanting down. It's dipping underneath me here, and it comes back up over on this side. Now that heaving and buckling is the result of thousands and thousands of years of activity in the Earth's crust. Plate tectonics and seismic activity are other more scientific names used to describe that kind of thing. For over the years, different stones and minerals are moved around and deposited in various locations of the Earth. Now, when those miners were digging these tunnels, what they were looking for was, of course, gold. And as they knew, Gold is extremely heavy. So, in the years after the quartz that the gold was originally formed with broke up, that heavy gold was freed and allowed to settle and trip down through all of this material down to the bedrock, where it would drift along and collect in the pocket. Now, those pockets are what the miners were chasing, and that's why they would dig down this far. Now, obviously, though, when the miners discovered the gold would settle down this deep, the problem they were facing was how first to get through all of this material above it, which at first was pretty difficult for them. Because thousands of years ago, during the Ice Age, all of this material froze solid and became known as permafrost. Well, the solution they found to deal with that permafrost was steam. Up above on the surface, they would fire a boiler. They would send steam down along these lines here, where it would come up to the point, this one. They would use that steam to simply thaw away the walls and ceilings so they could chip and scoop up the material and then they'd haul it to the bottom of the shaft in the ore car along these railway here. <clears throat> well, even with that means of getting through the permafrost, it was still quite a lot of exhausting work for them to get down. But so before they'd even begin digging, they'd look for some form of sign or guarantee from Mother Nature to pinpoint where the gold was and make all this worth their while. And in particular, they look for other mineral deposits, like you'll see over there. <clears throat> now this is a zinc deposit. Everyone see this big blue spray vein in there? Well, they spot these veins on the surface, they follow them. They dig down here to the bedrock and branch out in several directions along this floor. Just to that goes in. Before it would ever break. 
another interesting term for this material, and perhaps to make my point a bit more clear, is Leverite. Or in other words, leave it right there, it's worthless. <laughs> Everyone asks us if this is gold, it's mica, so keep an eye out for it. Thanks guys, all the fun. <laughs> Now, as you can imagine, it was actually quite a fair amount of work for them to push those clunkety old old cars along. They're headed up to the service now that low, and I'll join them in a moment. I'll show you more about the above ground operations there. Now, behind me here, you can see a pile of bones. These are the skeletal remains of animals that existed 10 to 30,000 years ago, and have long since been buried and preserved. And we happen to have a small tusk fragment from a woolly mammoth. It's quite a pride for us. And we have more bones like these for you to look at up top. For now, though, I'll stand up by the front car, and you can get a closer peek at this tusk on your way out. Well, that's about all I have for them down here, Earl. More than this, I can put them to work. They did sound pretty darn spunky this morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's nice and comfortable because it's raining yeah. out, so we appreciate that. How about a hand for Tim as we get ready to exit, please? Yeah. The noise you heard now was the brakes releasing, and just a little bit takes some time for that to finish up. We'll start the end. simple reasons for it too, just easy to keep it warm during the cold winter temperatures. All the material on the roof, the logs, moss, and grass it got right here from the surrounding area. Now Bob's already got some material in that bucket there. Thanks, Bob. We're going to go ahead and demonstrate our rocker box. Now remember, this is very portable. They bring it in and out of the field. There's a screen on the top. Inside on the bottom there, they look like ribs. They're called ripples. We're working on that principle we talked about, that gold is 19.5 times heavier than water, 8, 10, 12 times heavier than anything else we will encounter. So the screen on the top catches large rocks now and then, good sized pieces of gold. Inside, as they pass over those ribs because of the way gold gets trapped. So we got some separation going. He's going to give us an idea of what panning's about right now. Some of us won't be able to see real well, but see the side-to-side -side action. He has got much in that pan, so it's going to go quick. He's washing the rocks in the water in the pan, letting the water come in like a light wave, and like this way, the uh, mica, that's the real light material. Goes down to the nitty-gritty now, see if he has any color. Where are you getting that pan on? No? Okay. Thank you very much, though. We appreciate the demonstration. Bells ringing, folks. We'll wait till everybody seats. And then we'll break this one hour for our next stop. Here we go. Now, what Tim has done while we were waiting here, he followed underneath this here and he worked hard to the bottom of the shaft here on the right. Now, we'll bring the bucket up and you'll see him work here, okay? This is what it would look like now. Everything that you see on the right. This is what it would look like right around the turn of the century. Mike and Marshall waiting for some picture cameras ready. Right here where they are, we have a little steam engine by the shaft. Here he comes. Those piles there we got pretty big. They moved the gin poles around as they needed to for more room. 
When the summer times will come, they let the piles thaw out so they could wash all the gold from them. Now that required a great deal of high pressure water. So the summer work would begin by trenching for miles to the tops of these high ridges here, which would serve to collect and channel millions of gallons of water downhill to these hydraulic water cannons. And those water cannons would then be used to blast those piles clean and wash all the gold through their sluice boxes they'd have set up nearby. Now those days, the sluice boxes were pretty crude and simple. They were made out of wood with wooden riffles and burlap to catch the gold. But that burlap proved to be the most efficient means of recovering the gold from these pay dirt piles. Now behind here next to Marshall is the boiler I was referring to. They were fueled by wood. They would consume an entire cord of wood a day. They would clear whole hillsides to keep them fueled, and that's why they called them the dragon. Because they would eat so much wood and breathe fire and spit smoke everywhere. But of course, what the boiler would do is boil the water. Which was in the steam down along these black lines here. So I'm going down below to the tunnel. I'm going to draw those piles. And some others to go to their steam engines, like the one Mike's operating for. They would call those the steam donkey. And the name is indicative of their almost stubborn and very often untimely breakdown. However, they remain very capable of making this work a whole lot easier for those miners. All that remains today of that era are just a few remnants of equipment like this and many memories. But of course, the spirit of Gold Fever lives on in modern form, and that's what we're going to show you now. Thank you, Tim. You bet. Mike, Marshall, we'll see you guys up at the Cook Shack. Folks, please have a seat. We've got uh, one more stop to make, and we'll be at the Eldorado Gold Mine. Here we go. All right, folks. All right, are we ready to get some gold? Yes. Uh. <laughs> All right, are we ready to get some gold? Yes. Now that's good, because you kind of and the whole crew here got one thing only on our mind this morning. We want to help each and every one of you find some gold and have a little fun at the same time. So we got a stockpile of some of the best painters you'll ever see within reach of what's got to be the longest sluice box in Alaska. We're to caution about that sluice yes. box. We want you to have fun. When we get back to the sluice box, for safety's sake, please do not step into the sluice box or try to step all the way across. <laughs> Thanks, okay? The other out of crew is going to give you a hand with the doors on the train. Quick them off, make sure you got everything with you, and follow us. Let's... Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, we got a display case of 19 ounce nugget on down in the cook shack, but just to wet your taste buds, here's a two and a half ounce, and here's a, come on out of there, an ounce and three quarters. Now, the rarity on these has a lot to do with the fact that the premium price on nuggets. Um, the way the market is today, the miners aren't cutting loose with it, so make sure you see the ones inside, because they're just gorgeous. Now, historically, come down to the spread out if you like to watch them. You know, our season is five months long, seven days, 14 hour days, 30 o'clock, 30 days, 30 hour 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 days, 
delights me. I'm sorry. Why well, did paint the house this color one time? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that beautiful? And you think about the incredible journey to this. So let there be light to my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good